And then, grabbing her by the head and the throat, dragged her to the middle of the room and placed his heavy hand over her mouth. You were watched tonight, you she-devil. Every word you said was heard. Then if every word I said was heard, it was heard that I spared you. Bill, dear Bill, you cannot have the art to kill me. Think of all that I have given up only this one night for you. Bill, Bill, for dear God's sake, for your own, stop before you spill my blood. I have been true to you upon my guilty soul. I have. The robber freed one hand and grasped his pistol. Go to England and perhaps gather material for a book on that not sufficiently known country. <laughs> Keep a notebook. Publish it on my return. Should I do it? Go to a London lecture in some small hall somewhere in the West End? I'm tempted to venture it. What'd I draw? After balancing, considering, and weighing the matter in every point of view, I've made up my mind, with God's will, to go to America. Then there are those cast-iron images, I will not call them men, who demand with red faces and lusty voices what seasickness is and whether it really is as bad as it's represented to be. There was one who was particularly torturing. And I confess, I never felt such gratification and gratitude of heart as I did when I heard from the ship's doctor that he'd been obliged to place a large mustard poultice on the stomach of that very gentleman. I date my own recovery from the receipt of that intelligence. <laughs> I've suffered since I've been in England. In the first place, right away from a newsman going around with a big, red, highly displayed placard in the place of an apron. He was selling newspapers, and he had two sentences on that placard, which would have been all right had they been punctuated properly, but they weren't. They were run on with no sentence, no comma or anything, and those two sentences could easily create the wrong impression, for they said, Mark Twain arrives, Ascot Cup stolen. <laughs> Our hotel in New York was on fire again the other day. <laughs> but fires are quite a matter of course in this country. The London Hotel was a disappointment. It was up a back alley and we figured it would be cheap. But now it was built for the moneyed races. It had a brass band for dinner and little else. It had that so-called housekeeping where they have six Bibles and no corkscrew. <laughs> when not aflame, ours was a very comfortable hotel. <laughs> Americans, they don't do like the English people. Englishmen talk through their noses. Now, Americans say, no. The Englishman says, no. <laughs> Americans say, cow. The Briton says, cow. Well, Americans at, at large, we shorten the A sound. We say, glass of water. Well, these sounds are more pleasant than yours. Now, you may not think that they're right. Well, in, in English, they may not be. But in American, they are. Now, when you're exhausted, you say you're knocked up. We don't. <laughs> if they will not force their accursed domestic institution in my face, I will not attack it, for I did not come here for that purpose. But I honestly believe that we are much better qualified to judge of its horror and atrocity than he who has been brought up in the midst of it. We hired a slave boy there in Hannibal from somebody. He, he was born on the 
on the eastern shore of Maryland and taken halfway across the continent and sold. He was a cheerful spirit, kind, gentle, and just about the noisiest person who ever lived, perhaps. I mean, all day long. He was singing, yelling, whooping, hollering. It was devastating, maddening, unendurable. So one day I lost all my temper and I went raging to my mother and I said that Sandy had been singing for an hour straight without a break and I could not stand it anymore and couldn't she please get him to shut up? <laughs> well, tears came into her eyes and her lip trembled and, and she said something like this. Poor thing, when he sings, it shows he's not remembering. And that heartens me. But when he's still, I'm afraid he's thinking, and I cannot endure that. That boy will never see his mother again. I heard him once during that season. It was in December at Steinway Hall. Dickens' audience sat in a pleasant twilight while he read from under bright light shed upon from concealed lamps. He started with an odd introduction. In fact, no introduction at all. And the robber hurried with a strong cord to the housetop. Of all the ferocious cries that ever fell on mortal ears, None could exceed the cry when he was seen. Those at the back told those at the front to set fire to the house. Others adjured the officers to shoot him dead. Others, with oaths and execrations, clutched at him in the air. Some called for sledgehammers, some for ladders. Others ran with lights to and fro to fetch them. I promise 50 pounds cried Mr. Brownlow from the nearest bridge. To the man who takes that murderer alive! He placed his foot upon the stack of chimneys and firmly fixed one end of the cord around it and with the other end made a, a hard running noose by the use of his hands and teeth. With the rope at his back, he could drop to within a less distance of the ground than his own height. And he had his open knife ready to cut the cord and drop. At the instant that he put the loop over his head, and before slipping it under his armpits, he glanced at the rooftop behind him. I give you the American gentleman. God forgive me for putting two such words together. <laughs> Mark Twain. I will not waste much time with this introduction. I know nothing about this man except two things. One is he's never been to the penitentiary. The other is... I can't imagine why. <laughs> What's an Englishman? A person who does things because they've been done before. What's an American? A person who does things because they haven't been done before. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you have heard so much of my voice this evening I will not impose upon you the additional burden of listening to any more. Life is short. Why should speeches be long? <laughs> One hour and 30 minutes. Just right. <laughs>